Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy, vote up or vote down the debt ceiling deal forged between House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and Mr. 10 percent, the big guy, President Biden. The agreement in principle, uh, the Freedom Caucus uh, took to the microphones yesterday, had a press conference saying in no uncertain terms that zero Republicans should vote for this. It's a bad deal. Here's Freedom Caucus Chairman Congressman Scott Perry trillions and trillions of dollars in debt for crumbs, for a pittance, every single thing. Take the student debt bailout, the student loan forgiveness, Biden forgives, you pay. None of that changes. Take, take the, uh, the assault on American energy with the uh, so-called Inflation Reduction Act. All of those subsidies killing American energy continued unbridled. The permitting reform, all it does is seeks to increase and impose more of the Green New Deal faster on the American people. Faster. Now, at least at least $4 trillion in debt for nothing from the strongest position a Republican has had generally and certainly our elective lifetime here and generally probably since we've been paying attention to politics. The Speaker himself, the Speaker himself has said on numerous occasions, the greatest threat to America is our debt. And now is the time to act. We had the time to act. And this deal, this deal fails, fails completely. Yeah, I mean, I I really I don't understand what Scott Perry is saying, even though I'm with the House Freedom Caucus in spirit, in spirit. So one, um, the seemingly permanent pause on student loan repayments is out in this agreement. So people have to start paying their student loans back and. Uh, and and Biden's loan student loan debt uh, forgiveness gambit is before the Supreme Court and could be ruled unconstitutional that he exceeded his authority. Um, the the Republicans are in the strongest position a Republican has been in in recent years. How's that? A slim majority in one chamber of the two without an executive. It was just a few years ago when President Trump was president that you had President Trump and majorities of Republicans in both the House and the Senate. How are you in a stronger position now? Uh, I I just the arguments that are being advanced by House Freedom Caucus to oppose this just are not persuasive to me. And, you know, I regret to say that includes uh, my congressman down in southwest Florida, Byron Donalds, who is part of the Freedom Caucus and had his say. Washington is doing it again. While you were celebrating Memorial Day, all of our men and women who gave their lives for this great nation, and you were spending time with your family and your friends, this town was cutting another crap deal that's going to put you more in debt with no real changes whatsoever. So the American people need to understand full and well, do not listen to the talking points. Do not listen to the cool phrases that are being thrown out in commercials on CNN or Fox or MSNBC, because Washington is lying again. This bill has no cap in raising the debt, just a date in the future. We have no idea what that number is going to look like. Some people are saying $4 trillion. Some people are saying $3.5 trillion. This bill in year one might cut $12 billion if you just want to be generous. So who here thinks it's cool to cut $12 billion in exchange for $4 trillion? All right. Well, um, as a counterbalance, I thought Newt Gingrich on Hannity last night sort of had the best response to these arguments being advanced by the Freedom Caucus when he was asked, well, if the Freedom Caucus's position, and it's not clear to me because they really haven't stated it, but if their position is that what we pass in the House should be presented to Biden as a take it or leave it, last best final, we are not willing to negotiate, which ironically was the position Biden was taking until McCarthy dragged him to the table. But anyway, if that was the if the Freedom Caucus position was the position of the entire caucus and the speaker, then what would happen? Biden would have said no. Uh, the financial markets would have collapsed. The Republicans would have been crowded into a position where 20 or 30 of them 
would have joined the Democrats, and six or eight of them would have joined the Democrats in the Senate, and you would have a debt ceiling with no cuts, no changes, no reforms. I mean, that, this, is, this is chess. This is not checkers. It's not tic-tac-toe. And you've got to think through not just one step, but five, six, or eight, or ten steps. And in that consequence, I think that Kevin McCarthy got a pretty good deal. And most importantly, he shifted the balance of power and the balance of leadership away from both the Senate and the White House. And that is, frankly, a historic experience comparable to what we did in 1995. Uh, what says Steve Moore? He joins us now, economist, Godzilla author. Steve, thanks for being with us. Hey, guys. Good morning. So, Freedom Caucus or, <laughs> or McCarthy, Newt, and company? You know, I'm somewhere in the middle on this. I mean, I originally came out, you know, pretty strongly in favor of this. And you're right, Dan, that you know Republicans only control one half of one third of the power in Washington and by a very slim margin. You know, that's the other thing people have to remember is that, you know, McCarthy can only lose, you know, five, four or five votes uh, of his own caucus. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of people who are not against big government and even in the Republican caucus. So I would say this. I think uh, on on balance, this is pr- a pretty good deal. Although, Dan, I actually think he caved in a little too early. I think he could have held out for a lot more. Uh, you know, you're looking at, for example, the work requirements for welfare. They they turn out to be really not much at all. You know, you look at, uh, you know, the spending caps. There are all sorts of, uh, you know, ways around the caps that that I'm, that I'm irritated by. And, you know, I don't understand why we're allowing most the vast majority of this IRS funding to go through. I mean, I just I find that to be kind of reprehensible. We're still going to give them you know, 70, 80 billion dollars for for the IRS expansion. So I'm very conflicted. I think the best outcome, this will pass. And I think it's appropriate for for uh, the conservatives to say, no, this isn't good enough. I, I think if I were in Congress, I'd probably say that. And one other quick point. Look, let's be very clear about this. It, this debt ceiling increase is a result of the six trillion dollar spending spree by Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Republicans voted for virtually none of this. A few voted for uh, some of these bills, but most of them were Democrat-only bills. So I feel very strongly the people who should have to vote for to raise the debt ceiling are the Democrats. They they broke it. They should have to fix it. Well, Although, isn't, is, isn't well, Kirby... Oh, okay, go. In, in the House, though, I mean, per the deal that's, that McCarthy made as Speaker, he needs a majority of the caucus to support the deal. Otherwise, he would be in violation of the deal he made with his caucus. Well, that's a good point, Dan. And I would simply say that's why he probably should have held out for more. I mean, look, he held a lot of the cards, not all the cards. But once he got that bill through the House, you know, the the other thing is, I think one strategic mistake McCarthy made, and I'm a fan of McCarthy. I think he's done on balance a pretty good job here. But every time they reached a snag where Biden would say, no, I'm not going to cave on that, he should have just walked out of the room and say, OK, look, we you know, if you if you don't want to negotiate with me and you don't want to give us some of our demands, then guess what? We're done. You get a bill through the Senate. You go to cut Chucky Schumer and wait and get him to vote for a bill. They run the Senate, Dan, and they never voted for a bill that they could get through. So, you know, I feel like uh, we could have gotten more. But in the end of the day, this is, a you know, a. Uh, you know, I'm not going to strike up the band for this, but I think it it does provide some benefit. The the CBO says it will cut the debt by 1.5 trillion over 10 years, and you know that. But guess what? That still means it goes up by 12 trillion. <laughs> well, isn't curbing any spending a win? Yes, yes, yeah. And you know what? You you make a really good point, uh, Amy, because the only thing that really matters is the first year, because 20. You know, next year we have an election. We'll have a new Hopefully, we'll have a new president and then you start over again. So, you know, what happens in the third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh year in this deal is is really meaningless. And one thing to be said for this deal is it does put a cap uh, and cuts uh, the domestic discretionary spending, you know, by my count, by about uh, 30 or 40 billion. So it's about a six percent cut. Which is pretty good, yeah. Look, I'm kind well, of in the middle on this. That's where well, where I stand. Well, the, the other thing too, it seems to me, I, I don't I, this this like marginal line that the Freedom Caucus is drawing over this. I, I just don't 
understand. I mean, I understand it to some extent. They're serving a particular political constituency and a political position. But just on the merits, look, I mean, what do you think you're going to get done in this context with a debt ceiling raise? The only way you're going to shift the paradigm, which is really the goal here, is to use this as a prelude to 2024, just as sort of Newt Gingrich was intimating, and yeah. say we, we have to get control of both chambers. Yeah. We got to have a Republican in the White House, and then we need to do something about profligate right. spending and printing and spending in a way that we didn't when we had Trump in the White House and control of the House and the Senate a few years back. That's the real play, ultimately. Look, I, I generally agree with that. Dan, I think you've got it pretty much exactly right. Although I would say, you know, is even someone who worked for Donald Trump, and you made this point earlier, I mean, let's not forget, Republicans did have control of the House, the Senate, and the White House for uh, two years, and we did a big, good tax cut, but the Republicans didn't control spending. Exactly. So, you know, that, that was McCarthy's point, although he was one of them. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, look. The other point I think is really important, though, that's related to what you just said is right now there's kind of a mini revolt against Kevin McCarthy, you know, and I that's not where people should be pointing their anger. If you're a yeah. fiscal conservative, want to return to fiscal sanity, the anger should be addressed towards Schumer and the Democrats in the House and Joe Biden. And, and as long as they're in office, you know, we're going to face a massive, massive financial blowout in this country. And Republicans don't have the power right now to do it. So to get rid of McCarthy doesn't solve the problem. You no, exactly. Get rid of Joe Biden. Exactly. I mean, it, ma it makes no sense. I mean, they, they should be reminding everyone that, you know, yep. we would the situation wouldn't be as dire if we didn't have 17 Republicans sign on to Biden's infrastructure bill, for example. So we got a problem with our own party, too. That's a good point. I mean, you know, so but but on balance, most of those bills, the, the, most of the six trillion was passed with that. Remember, the worst bill of all was the one point nine trillion dollar yeah. spending bill that Biden's passed in his first month in office. Uh, and that bill passed without a single Republican vote. It was just a basically a big bailout to blue states. The covid crisis was over and they spent one point nine trillion dollars. So. <laughs> but know, it was still, but it was still it was still passed in a you know and so I mean to get set this precedent that we're going to pass things and then we're going to be able to to uh, rescind them if we don't like them if the balance of power changes that every time we bump up against the debt ceiling I mean that that there lies the incentive for Republicans to not be bumping up against the debt ceiling when they're in charge so we don't have these you know uh, crises every eighteen months. Well, look, this was a false crisis anyway. I'm so well, sick I and agree. tired every time I read the newspaper of hearing people talking about the idea of a default. You know, every new, oh, my God, we're going to have a default. That was never on the table. It was a total scare tactic by the left and by Biden and by uh, Janet Yellen. There is zero truth to this idea. Like, let's say for a minute that this thing blows up. You know, I don't think it will. But if it blows up, are we going to have a default on the debt? No. No, there's no default on the debt. For one thing, they can probably go through mid to late August before they even reach the X state because they also have ways of finagling these numbers. But the other thing is, even if you reach that date, guess what? You pay the bonds. The 14th Amendment requires the federal government to pay the bondholders. And that means, you know, you probably would see. Uh, you know, and by the way, uh, Medicare and Social Security get paid because they have a, tr a, quote, trust fund. What gets cut? Oh, the Department of Education, the uh, Department of Energy. Uh, you know, maybe we can't make foreign aid payments. I'm not going to lose sleep over that. And that's not a default. Steve Moore, Wall Street Journal. Uh, well, formerly Wall Street Journal columnist, Wall Street Journal contributor, economist and Godzilla author. Steve, thanks as always. Appreciate it. OK, guys. Have a great week. Take care. Thanks, you too. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. You've made the switch, and it feels so good. You've switched to Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560.